right, so I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of uh, limb alignment in uh, joint preservation uh, and a little bit about osteoarthritis, but more on, uh, on, uh, on joint preservation, such as doing osteochondral allografts, uh, microfractures, meniscal transplantations, a number of the topics that we've already uh, heard about. Uh, you've seen my disclosures before. Nothing's changed in the last few days. I don't see Ben Schaefer here today. This is Ben's summer house. Um, and just like, just like uh, location is key in... Uh, uh, real estate alignment is key if you're going to do joint preservation op op operations. And it's also an important thing to do with complex uh, uh, knee instabilities. And you have to look at alignment before soft tissue e issues, uh, um, if you're going to do uh, late reconstructions for, um, for uh, posterior lateral or other type instabilities. You've got to look very carefully at your alignment before you do your soft tissue reconstruction because if you do it in a misaligned knee, your, your soft tissue will stretch out and you'll be uh, stuck. The other is you have to think about the slope of your knee when you're doing it. And uh, the guy on the right, the house on the right here, uh, somebody didn't look at high tide when they were buying this waterfront property. The tide came in and obviously you have to beware. There's certain things, you, troubles you can get into with osteotomies. Non-unions happen more with opening than closing wedge. Uh, you can get loss of uh, correction, uh, lose the position of your osteotomy again more commonly with open than closing wedge osteotomies. In osteoarthritis, you get significantly less pain relief um, by doing an osteotomy than you do with a unicompartmental arthroplasty. Metal on plastic doesn't hurt as much as an unloaded joint. Um, so that there are very limited indications for osteotomies, joint preservation, and then in my hands, osteoarthritis in very high demand people. I think they're, if you're better off um, doing, thinking about uni or metal and plastic than you are thinking about osteotomy for OA. Radiographs are key, as, uh, as Tony just alluded to. I, need, I get AP weight bearing, I get Rosenberg or PA bent knee weight bearing views, and then long leg alignment views on everybody that I'm thinking about osteotomy on. Um, the, uh, what happens is with standard osteoarthritis of the knee, as you see on the top photograph there, this is a medial compartment of a um, left knee looking from the lateral portal and you can see the area of exposed bone is anterior, it's just behind that meniscus. And that's typical idiopathic OA. The post-traumatic OA that we see from ACL tears, meniscal tears is typically more posterior as we see in this uh, um, right knee looking back there you can see the exposed bone is on the posterior aspect of it. So. I get both AP and Rosenberg views on anybody if I'm looking for OA. Correction, you have to think very differently uh, when you're dealing with osteoarthritis um, versus joint preservation. In osteoarthritis, we are all taught that you want to unload the damaged compartment and, and overload the um, opposite compartment. So typically, if you're doing a, a varus knee and you're uh, transferring the weight-bearing axis laterally, you want to put it at about 62% from medial to lateral or someplace on the downslope of the lateral tibial sp uh, spine. If you're doing it for a joint preservation, you don't want to do that. You don't want to overload it because typically you're doing this on somebody who's in their 20s or 30s um, or early 40s and you don't want to wear out that compartment. So what I try to do is just get it a little, get it in the interspinous region and just a little bit either lateral or medial depending on um, whether you're doing fem a varus or valgus knee. I always scope the knee, and if, uh, if the patient comes to me unscoped who's been referred for this, I'd tell them that as part of the procedure, we'll scope them first, and we don't know what we're uh, necessarily going to proceed. The top arthroscopic picture is act actually a lateral compartment of somebody who had pretty good-looking x-rays, um, and if you look at her tibial plateau, we were going to do a, um, a valgus osteotomy and overload that compartment. I abandoned uh, that procedure and just said, no, you don't want an osteotomy. In fact, your next step is a total knee replacement if you're ready for it. And do remember the patellofemoral joint. One of those things, if you're doing a closing wedge, you can actually address a patellofemoral joint at the same time as you're doing a, um, a, a closing wedge uh, valgus producing osteotomy to unload the medial side. And that's the trochlea on somebody that uh, I'll show you their uh, osteotomy pictures in a little bit. Be careful of the slope. Um, the average posterior slope in a knee is 8 to 10 degrees. If you increase the slope, you're going to increase anterior directed forces on an ACL graft. Um, so if you're doing um, something that's going to have ACL grafting associated with it, get, you'll get yourself in trouble. 
and it also will tend to limit extension. So if you've got somebody who's already lost a little bit of flexion, you're going to make them worse. The opposite is true with a decrease in slope. You'll tend to strain a PCL graft and you create recurvatum. Here's a patient that was one early on in my uh, doing PUDU plates, uh, and you can see on the x-ray on the left there that that PUDU plate's anterior. It's not posterior. It should be back on the posterior cortex. And from that, I increased the, uh, the slope. It was somebody I was doing a two-stage um, uh, uh, operation to um, uh, correct, the, their val correct their varus knee, give them a valgus-producing osteotomy, and then coming back to do their ACL. And so what I did is I recognized this when I did their ACL reconstruction. I actually did a closing wedge osteotomy anteriorly. I did a frontal blazed osteotomy to reduce their slope, and she's actually done very well. Um, but it was, uh, that was a technical error on my part. So there are multiple techniques. They're not created e equally. Opening wedge is relatively new. It's been around for 10 plus years now. It's simple. You can fine tune it intraoperatively. I think it's a little more uh, user friendly than the lateral side. The lateral side closing wedge, it's 30 plus track year history. It's complicated. It's best done with a very good uh, guide system. And I use the system that's sold by Zimmer now. It was actually uh, uh, developed by Aaron Hoffman uh, back in the early 80s. Um, and it, uh, is, uh, is a, it's a very elegant, simple way to do the closing wedge very reproducibly. Um, there are problems with the ocean opening wedge, prolonged weight bearing. I use it for anybody who's going to get seven and a half millimeters or less of um, correction. So that's fairly small corrections. Um, if you do a bigger correction, you're going to want to use auto autologous bone. And what I now do for my autologous bone is go up to the femur and I take a eight millimeter 10 to 10 millimeter size coring reamer from the, um, acu the arthrex systems, go in and take two nice long plugs of cancellous bone out of the femur, bring those down to graft the, uh, the, uh, the wedge. Uh, so anybody that you're doing eight millimeters or more of correction, be sure you use autologous bone on. Here's one you can see. Talk about if you disrupt the lateral cortex when you're doing it, and it's fairly easy to do that as you start out. You have to do something over there, and you should go over and actually put a two-hole AO plate, just bridging that where you made the gap, gap to hold it together. Because if you don't, what you end up with is a non-union, as we see here, hardware broken, um, osteotomy is not healed, um, and you're stuck with having to fall back to something a little bit bigger. I don't have her later uh, x-rays, but uh, she also wanted her left knee treated, and she's now got a total knee on that side. So uh, um, you've got to be careful uh, with your osteotomy technique. Issues with closing wedge, and there are some. It's not a panacea, as I alluded to. You've got to do an extensive exposure. Subperiosteal, take all the anterior compartment musculature off it to see it. You have to do something with the tib-fib joint or the fibula, and I actually, uh, I osteotomize the uh, uh, fibula just at the junction of the head-neck portion, so right where the perineal nerve is, and that uh, um, little retractor that you can see in my um, right hand there is between the perineal nerve and the fibular neck, so I actually make sure I see where the nerve is and protect it and uh, do the osteotomy there. I've done about 300 uh, closing wedge osteotomies there. I have one transient perineal nerve palsy that lasted for two days. So it's not common, um, but I look at it on everybody and protect it on everybody. I just don't like springing the tib-fib joint because I think that leads to potential other problems. Have to use precise cuts, as I said, the, alluded to the jig of Aaron Hoffman, which I think works well. One of the pluses is that wedge of bone that you take out you can use it to elevate the tibial tubercle. So here's that trochlea that I showed earlier that's pretty lousy looking trochlea. This is a young, vigorous guy in his 30s. He's six foot, six inches tall, weighs 320 pounds, and had medial bone on bone in this trochlea. He's now six years out, so he's in his early 40s and still gimping along. He comes in about every six months for visco supplementation, and hopefully I'll get him uh, carried along long enough that you think he might be close to 50 when he needs his total knee. Um, pluses, the other plus with a closing wedge is you can weight bear early on. I let these people actually um, be weight bearing as tolerated. Typically, they don't put much pressure on it for the first two, three weeks. Usually by four weeks, they're putting a lot of weight on it, and at six weeks, they're oftentimes healed. Um, I now, as I said, 300 plus 
osteotomies. I have one non-union and one delayed union for uh, uh, closing wedge osteotomies. The non-union was one of those 300 pounders, and the delayed union was somebody who tried to go back to running in about eight weeks after surgery. So he was uh, he pushed the envelope. So healing is not the issue with closing wedge. There are other differences that you need to be aware of and think about. Um, all of those things that are in yellow are statistically significantly different. This is uh, Brower et al. had two articles in the British Journal of Bone and Joint Sur uh, Surgery comparing closing and opening wedge HTOs. You see you actually decrease the insol solvati ratio if you do an opening wedge. So you move their tibial tubercle distally, you're going to create a patella baja, not with a closing wedge, but with an opening wedge. And lots of people will say, well, you get troubles with, a, with a advancing, troubles with a patella baja with closing wedges. Well, you don't if you move them early. And so I put all of these people in a CPM machine, get them moving right away, and try to get them stretched out. And so you won't change that insol solvati ratio if you move them early. Tibial slope, you will tend to increase it slightly with the opening wedge. You've got to be very uh, careful. Put your block that you're holding that open with very posterior, right, basically on the posterior cortex of the medial tibia. And I actually now, I use a trapezoidal wedge on each one so that the wedge is a little higher posterior than anterior uh, to try to minimize that increase in tibial slope. And they do collapse a little bit. You'll notice that you lose about two to three degrees of correction with an opening wedge and that you correct it to a certain area and they do collapse a little bit down. So I tend to slightly overcorrect with an opening wedge. Finally, we come to the uh, valgus knee and, and correcting them. And the typical valgus knee, you don't want to do the operation on the tibia because your weight-bearing surface is already parallel to the floor. And so if you do um, a varus-producing osteotomy, you're going to create a sloped tibia in the uh, uh, coronal plane. So I do a distal femoral osteotomy. There's very little data out there. Only correct it to the medial spine. Don't go way over medially or these people will be unhappy. Um, and there's the medial closing wedge done on the femur, femoral side is a little more difficult to do, technically more demanding, and there aren't great instruments for it. The lateral opening wedge requires, again, prolonged weight bearing, um, a little bit uh, um, uh, more forgiving. Um, these are all written down in your handout, things to be aware of. Um, the lateral uh, wedge, you need to uh, have it positioned in the absolutely correct position. If you crack the medial cortex, which you can do, you're going to end up with issues as far as increased correction because as the medial cortex collapses, and we'll look at it here, if you were to have this collapse, crack through here, what happens is you collapse into more varus and you end up overcorrecting. Very important point, you see where the, this is the back of the medial femoral condyle right here, that's the back of your articular surface. You want your cut with your osteotomy to go between the cortex here and that cortex there. So you've got very little spot to put it in. So you have to really uh, line it up properly, uh, make sure you get it right in the right position um, before, you, uh, before you make your cuts. But they, uh, they will heal up. Here's uh, that same person that we just did um, using uh, the, an opening wedge technique. Looks fine and uh, uh, heals up well. Distal femoral osteotomy, if you've got a big correction to do, um, here's a... Uh, 42-year-old, still very competitive female hockey player with horrible valgus knees, symptomatic on the left side, not on the right. Um, so we did a, uh, um, a medial closing wedge. I used the same Aaron Hoffman jigs. I just put them upside down and backwards because we're working on the femur as opposed to the tibia. Um, and you can take a nice precise cut, um, create a flat surface where you have bone on bone, and then just fix it with an AO plate. Um, which uh, g gives you a good rigid fixation so that you can move these people early and again you can weight bear these people early. Remember that osteotomy is not simple, it's not forgiving, uh, but if you're going to do any kind of joint preservation you have to be prepared to do it um, because alignment will kill anything else you do in the, in the knee if it's not correct. Thank you.